Here's my hot take. I reckon the Compass Rose is the best story beat in the whole starter set, but it's also somehow the dungeon which needs the most work because the combat balance is a little bit wacky. There's not a clear direction for the action to go room by room and half of the rooms are empty. So you and I, we are gonna fix it. And trust me, if you're feeling at all overwhelmed by the prospect of running this dungeon, by the end of this video, you're gonna feel much better better. Stick around. Before we get to the room by room breakdown and the harpy boss fight though, there are five things you got to keep in mind. Number one, the harpy could show up at any time. We are representing this through the threat dice. In the previous video with the shipwreck scramble minigame, we worked out what the threat dice should be. But if you didn't watch that video and you don't want to do the minigame, then you could just pick a D10. And then I literally want you to say this to the party. Okay, players, you are exploring the Compass Rose, where a harpy known as the Singing Moor has made her nest. But she could be back at any moment. This dice is the threat dice, and I'm going to roll it at the start of every round of combat. If it ever lands on a one, then the harpy arrives and enters initiative immediately. But if you manage to clear this dungeon without the harpy arriving, you'll have enough time to prepare the ship's ballista and shoot her out of the sky. And in this case, I think that clearing or completing the dungeon just means if the players find Aletha's charm. Important thing number two, Aletha's charm is not at the bottom of the ocean in the ship's hold in the captain's chest. No, instead it is on Aletha herself because we're saying that the ghoul on the middle layer of the ship is actually Aletha. Oh my goodness. And hey, I know that ghouls and zombies don't work the same. You can't die and become a ghoul, but I don't care about the law. I just think it's a cool story beat. Important change number three, you need to pay attention to the tide because if it's low tide, yeah, you can just use the dungeon map as it currently is where the bottom level is completely underwater and the middle level's a little bit underwater. But if it's high tide, then the bottom two levels are completely submerged. And if you fight in those areas, then you are using underwater combat rules. Important change number four is a bit of foreshadowing because I think after this dungeon is complete, it would be appropriate for the players to see Mech and Min, who are the two blue winged kobolds, gathering dragon bones so they can make a dragon effigy for Spark Render's ritual. And they could be flying off the bones and bickering about which of one of them is Spark Render's favourite. Important change number five is more of a personal favour. I lost my E. I don't know where it is. So if you see my E, do me a favour and let me know, because subscribe? What could that even mean? To get your players to the compass rose, you will need a hook to make them interested. The most obvious is that they are coming to the compass rose specifically to deal with Aletha's curse, because if they find her charm on her body and they break it, then the undead problem will cease to be. I can imagine this would be a quest given to them by Varnoth, who sees the undead washing up on shore and blames the players and says, this is your responsibility, your duty, please go do it go help with this. I'm an NPC quest giver. Or the party could be sent here specifically to kill the harpy because how are ships going to arrive on the island to ferry the players off if the harpy's here luring sailors to their death? So that's just more of like a logistical problem, right? Or they could be coming here specifically to collect an item that they left on the ship. Because you will recall in the very first video of this series, I said the players arrive on the compass rose and it sinks. Maybe they left something behind that they need to come pick up. For the purpose of our room by room breakdown, let's presume the players are entering from the top deck. No, they're not diving and swimming in through the hole in the hull. They're going in through the obvious entrance. So for everything that's above deck, like all this visible stuff here, the only things we really care about are the C2 forecastle where the ballista is and the crow's nest right in the middle. You want to showcase these elements of the map ASAP. For the blister right at the front of the ship, we're saying the players would need 10 minutes to repair it and get it in working order. Here are the stats you could use if you wanted to have your players use it in combat. The reason you want to show this blister to the party right at the beginning is because this is their reward for completing the whole dungeon without striking a one on the threat dice. You want to show this early so that they can get excited about it. 
Then we've got the crow's nest right in the center of the ship. We want to show this to the party as soon as possible because this is where the harpy is nesting. And if a player climbs up there and sees all the debris and hay and treasures and bones hidden in that little nest, they will know for certain the threat they are facing. They are in the domain of the singing more. And we also really want to highlight the fact that this is 50 feet off the ground. There's an element of elevation here that's going to become really important to the players when our harpy starts dropping people 50 feet onto the deck below. <laughs> C4, the captain's quarters. This room has a zombie encounter, because of course it does. But the purpose of this zombie encounter isn't to deplete the player's resources or to do any real damage or pose any real danger. Instead, it's an opportunity for you to roll your threat dice. At the start of every round of combat, you roll it. If it lands on a one, the harpy shows up, and now they're facing two battles on two fronts, and now the zombies are a threat. So I would recommend you use my custom design design for zombies, which we discussed in this video here, because otherwise this fight can become a little bit of a slog. This room has some loot and a hole in the floorboards over here in the corner. This is where the captain's treasure chest fell through the floor and is currently at the bottom of this whole dungeon in the hold. You could ask a player who has craftsman experience or perhaps sailor's experience to work out that a piece of furniture fell through the hole here. And if it's currently high tide, that would mean the floor below the players right now is completely submerged and water would be lapping at the edges of that hole. However, that bottom level right below the players is where Aletha the ghoul is hiding. So if the water's up to the lip there, she might be able to grab a player and drag them down or pop up herself and surprise them. That's up to you if you can find a dramatic moment and you're not going to wipe the party. <laughs> There's also this room C5, the galley. Hey, I'm suggesting you cut this room and combine this space on your map with the captain's quarters because there's nothing in this room. Room six is the crew's quarters, which is where everybody else on the ship sleeps. So the purpose of this room is to give some exposition about the character of Aletha because she wasn't always some evil ghoul. She used to be just some lady. So she was traveling along with the players to Stormwreck Isle, but she was traveling to put her husband's charm on his grave. Her husband's name was Brastos. But it was her errant prayer of, please, in this life or the next, let me make it to the island. <sighs> it was that errant prayer that caused all the undead to appear. So this room is your opportunity to see that relationship and humanize the character of Aletha a little bit more. You can do this through making a journal entry from her possessions or maybe a painting of the couple together or perhaps some love letters between the two characters. And you, the dungeon master, you should make that yourself. Make a fun little handout, singe the edges, stain it with coffee. Come on, you know you love doing it. There's also a bunch of loot underneath a floorboard, but the floorboard is trapped, oh no. What's weird is that like, this is the only trap in the whole campaign. So Dungeon Master, do not feel too bad if your rogue gets to disarm it. This is their only time to shine in that regard. Room seven is the mess hall, and I think you should cut this room because there is nothing useful here. Just combine this space with the, uh, the previous room, the cruise quarters. Room eight is the lower deck. This is where Aletha the ghoul is waiting in ambush. In fact, she's got some zombie allies that are in plain sight, but these zombies are bait. In fact, on one of the zombies, she's even put a fake charm to trick the players into thinking that zombie is Aletha. And when the players attack these zombies, Aletha pops out and tries to get an attack at advantage on somebody that didn't see her stealthed in the corner. Now, here's a big old warning about this fight. Ghouls do not mess around. They are lethal. They are lethal because when they hit somebody, they have a chance to paralyze them. Check out this condition. It doesn't mess around. Room nine is the hold. And this whole area is completely submerged. This is where the captain's treasure chest is sunk to the bottom. But the thing is about the contents in this treasure chest, they've got magical boots. Yar. They've got a bunch of like booty and treasure. Yar. But also we've got a book with lore about Aletha. Yar? Question mark. Like, why do we need this law now? If the players are here, they've probably already beaten Aletha and this law isn't going to enhance their experience of that fight anymore. It's only useful beforehand. So cut the book from the treasure chest. You don't need it, okay? Keep the books, 
keep the booty. Here's the tricky part though. How are you meant to run this harpy encounter, this boss fight, this climax of the whole dungeon? I've got a golden rule for you, and here it is. The harpy cannot enter combat alone because the singing moor is actually quite weak and she will die very, very easily. So if she enters combat via the threat dice of rolling a one, then she will have the other combatants that the players are currently fighting on her side. That's good. But if she enters combat alone, then you should bring along a second weaker harpy to be her mate and help her out. And her stat block is actually pretty underwhelming. So what I'd recommend you do is you focus all of her strategy on picking a player up and dropping them for maximum damage. Let's give her a single legendary resistance because she's a little bit scary. And this is what you're gonna do round by round. In the first round, the harpy needs to take cover in the crow's nest, right up top, 50 feet above the ground. Any players below are not gonna be able to target her with ranged attacks. And from up there, she starts to sing. This is gonna affect the entire ship. 300 feet, that's gonna hit everybody, unless they're like underwater or something. Any characters that are affected will start to walk towards the harpy. They can climb the rigging of the crow's nest at half speed, but remember, they can't use their dash action for movement because they're incapacitated while under the spell. In the second round, the harpy uses their action to grapple the nearest player. If that character is charmed, then there's no roll, automatically succeeds. Hey, this is your friend, the harpy, they're taking you on a trip. But if the character is not charmed, they'll have to roll a grapple check as normal. Then while grappling this character, she starts to fly directly up, moving at half speed because she's grappling somebody. In the third round, it's time for violence because the harpy will fly as high as they can and then use their free action to release the grapple. And that player, will tumble to the deck below. They're gonna take 1d6 damage for every 10 feet fallen. There is no saving throw, you just take that damage. And round four, I'm willing to bet she's looking rough at this point, she can leave, you know, she probably needs to flee if she survives this long. As for role playing the harpy though, like her motivations, the way she behaves, the way she speaks, I'm not very good at that, especially because I got a little bit confused about, hey, what's the difference between a siren and a harpy? Like, are these the same thing? Like, they just lure sailors to their death? Do you know what? Let's ask Dale Kingsmill. Dale, what is the difference between a siren and a harpy? All right, humans, here's the deal. You got your sirens, you got your harpies. You could be forgiven for mixing the two up since both are categories of Greek mythological bird chicks. Bird chicks? Bird chicks feels like it should be some kind of an oxymoron. Bird, bird women, bird ladies. Yes, that's right, I said bird ladies. The sirens were sea nymphs and as a result have regularly been depicted kind of like mermaids or beautiful sea spirits, but really they were just, they were just kind of birds with the faces of women on them. Famously, they would sing a bewitching song that would lure sailors to their death. Harpies, on the other hand, were not so beguiling. They were bird ladies, but they were more like ladies with wings. Sometimes described as vengeful demons, they most famously show up in the story of Jason and the Argonauts, where a king has ticked off Zeus and so he sends the harpies after him, and anytime he tries to eat something, a harpy swoops down and snatches it out of his hand. That's, that's what harpy means, it, it comes from the word meaning snatch. And then, just to really rub it in, they left the whole island covered in in, uh, in bird poop. At least I hope it was bird poop because... So now you know, you're informed. Get it right next, what is, what is that? What is that? What? It's an E. It's the letter E. That's weird. Please subscribe. Whoa, are your plays getting bogged down in the nitty gritty of D&D? Oh, you need a break. Well, you should include a mini game in your session. Click right here, click now, click, click. Click it.